right along. So one week ago tonight, our police chief uh, had a, what was it described as an emotional moment. I think outburst would be fair um, at the Metro Council meeting. Joining us now is Metro Councilman Dwight Hudson. Dwight, good morning. Welcome in. How are you, man? Hey, good, good, Brian. Thank you for having me. Glad to have you on here. Um, so you were there. Uh, you were part of the overall discussions. Um, sure. Walk me through a little bit of your perspective from Wednesday night. Yeah, you know, I, I really felt like, um, unfortunately, some of the language that was used, uh, you know, it's just really unfortunate, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, that, that item should have been a fact-finding mission, an effort on the council and the chief's part uh, to, to issue in some transparency, to see what we can do to make the situation better. Um, but unfortunately, it just the way it unfolded, um, it just wasn't healthy for our community. It wasn't it wasn't a good a good look. It, it wasn't productive at all to dealing with the issue. So at the heart of this, and, and other issues bubbled up as well, but uh, the um, legal funds is kind of where this all started. Um, do we have parameters of like very specifically what goes to where and when outside counsel should be called and what the city picks up the tab for? We do, yes. Yeah, so I can walk you through that issue. You know, um, it was back in 2020 where uh, the chief originally came to the council uh, and said, look, I, uh, we've got a lot of these issues coming in. We want to outsource some of this to a, a law firm that has some more specialty in that area. Uh, that original contract was $78,000, and I believe it passed unanimously through the council. Um, what we then saw as we went down the years, I think it was a a real controversy started in 2022, where those uh, those funds exceeded that budget of 78,000, and it got up to I think 230,000. Right. So anytime that I, as a council person who am responsible for the public fisc, uh, when I see a budget blown by that amount, it's going to raise some red flags for me, and I'm going to say, Hey, wait, we've got to take a look at this money. We've got to make sure we stay on budget uh, and stay within. That's roughly tripling. By the way, so. yeah, yes, yeah, so but really got out of hand. Um, so what we found was that there was some administrative tasks that were being handled by the uh, those attorneys that um, we could bring back in house. Um, we also found that uh, I think there were some attorneys that were working on the contract that didn't actually have uh, permission to be for us for us to be billed for those. Mm-hmm. So we've gone through and addressed a lot of those issues, um, and actually we we've, we've had the chief come back. Uh, actually, in this case, it was a deputy chief that came and reported to us. They they are bringing those costs down. Okay. So so that accountability, that cap that we put on, actually has worked. Mm-hmm. Um, but but look, when you, when the chief makes an accusation that we cut his legal fund, it's just totally inaccurate, right? Uh, and it has to be responded to. Um, I've asked the chief to go out and clarify that, to talk about how we've worked collaboratively uh, to get those costs under control. He has recognized to the council that. Uh, the costs were exceeding the budget, and, and it was an issue from a budgeting standpoint. Um, but then to come out now and, and, and characterize it as we're cutting your funding, defunding the police or something, it, it's totally irresponsible, and it's it's uncalled for. Okay, let me bring this part into the conversation. Mm-hmm. Because what you're talking about right now, um, while important, I don't know if it has anything to do with the nature of the discussion from stemming from the Brave Cave. How do these two things cross the streams that brings everything to a head? Well, that was a part of the chief's comments on Wednesday night was that we, we cut his legal funding, right? So that was a part of that accusation. Okay. So, no, it doesn't de- deal directly with the Brave Cave. It just uh, so much bubbled over all at once that everything exploded. Correct. Okay. Correct. Um, as for where we're at with the legal fund now, it's every, is everything back to good or what? Well, we actually have two items coming up next Wednesday on legal representation for the chief. Um, I've posed a couple of questions to the parish attorney and to the chief about it uh, just to make sure that the council is on the same page. Look, I do think ultimately we need to pay those older legal fees um, that that came up. Um, Moving forward, uh, I think they're up to about 130,000 right now. I'm pretty comfortable with that, although I do want to make sure that there's a couple of of pieces uh, that are that are addressed. Um, but I think we're getting to a much better spot with legal representation. He's got a month to go on the job. Is there anything still unresolved that's going to carry over beyond his tenure as chief of police? And what do we do when we get in that space? Uh, as far as issues that would deal with the council, I'm unaware of anything that will that will not okay. be resolved. Um, but internally, I, I can't. I couldn't answer that okay. question. Okay. 
Uh, we're talking with Metro Councilman uh, Dwight Hudson about uh, what started, what, what bubbled over last Wednesday night and where we've been since then. As far as the Brave Cave conversation is concerned, um, what was the tenor of that conversation? Because I feel like emotions were high there as well. Yeah, you know, if you go back and watch that council meeting, one of the things that I, I tried to do, I'm, I was the next speaker up after the chief spoke, and I really tried to bring the conversation back to the Brave Cave, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I do think that there remains to be some accountability there. Um, you know, one of the things that ultimately came out during the Brave Cave or when the, the story first broke from WAFB um, was this issue with uh, uh, Troy Lawrence Jr. Mm -hmm. Right. So Troy Lawrence Jr. is a known uh, issue liability within BRPD, in my opinion. Uh, we just a few months ago settled uh, a case with him where he had uh, put somebody in the back of a car and cursed at him a lot, muted his body camera, that kind of thing. So it was well covered in the media. Everybody was aware of it. Um, he was supposedly enrolled into a um, special mentoring program that the chief has to deal with officers that, you know, have issues. Um, but I, I'm, I'm sitting here, and I, I have a, a letter here in front of me of a transfer letter from Chief Paul uh, that actually put Troy Lawrence Jr., just before we settled that case, uh, into the street crimes unit. Look, mm -hmm. street crimes is a, it's a specialized unit. You're dealing with the worst of the worst. Uh, you're dealing with, you know, people that have a lot of issues. Okay. So if the controls are so loose within the department um, that – an officer like Troy Lawrence Jr., who we know is an issue, is getting put onto specialized units dealing with hardened law offenders, um, that's an issue for me, right? That's an issue that, that bubbles up to the chief's level. Um, look, okay. I think we have to address those types of issues. As an administration, uh, they need to make sure, as a council, we need to ensure that they are making sure that those kind of issues are addressed. Isn't this the type of situation that you're not, you're not going to know it's a bad situation until after it's already become a bad situation? Uh, as a council member, yes. Yeah. Uh, but I would say that if you are dealing with day-to-day -day issues in the police department, um, that type of issue could have been addressed on the front end. Look, mm -hmm. he, you know, that officer uh, should have been receiving – if he's going to stay on the force after those previous issues, which there's an argument to say that maybe he shouldn't, right. um, but if he's going to be on the force, he should be getting some really intense training. Um, that training should not include him being on a unit like street crimes. Okay. Uh, Metro Councilman Dwight Hudson is our guest. All right. So uh, Troy Lawrence Jr. is one aspect of this, but the overall Brave Cave involves more than just him, as we've seen the subsequent Correct, yeah. arrest as well. Yeah. How did the rest of this come to light? Well, so that's another question that is left unanswered, and I think we do absolutely have to address it. Look, um, my understanding is that uh, some of this was reported to Internal Affairs uh, well before the story broke, mm -hmm. and it wasn't properly investigated. We need answers on why that wasn't properly investigated. Wait, pause right there. Uh, this was before the story broke. Do we have a timeline on that, or is there a way to project a timeline on that as to when – all of this really started coming to light? Um, I think I, I don't have the timeline in front of me, so uh, I, I'm not sure. But I, I do know the chief said in his press conference that um, on Friday, the Friday press conference that the chief had, the issue was reported um, and not properly followed up on um, previous to the story breaking. I don't know how far in advance, uh, but he said they are, they are checking into it to see why it didn't get followed up with. The other issue is that the – the issue that resulted in the rest of all the other officers happened in 2020. Mm -hmm. So what, what's been happening for three years that, you know, we, we haven't addressed this issue yet. Right. Well, in, in that instance, um, I, this is why the timeline is so important, though, because we don't know, like people have been saying the Brave Cave has been around for decades being used for that. Meanwhile, uh, we've also heard that nobody heard about the Brave Cave until it broke in the news. At the same time, though, heard from numerous people that like, no, we, we, we knew this was a thing. So I yeah, I think you know you get caught up in the semantics of Brave Cave versus Street Crimes Unit operating out of the precinct on Plank Road, right? Right. That facility on Plank Road has been open for twenty years. It's been used in that context. Part of my questioning at the council meeting um, has been used in that context for many legitimate functions since that time. 
Uh, but what we're seeing now is that there were some issues, some cultural issues within those units. And, look, that's, that's really what bothers me the most is that this is now the second unit uh, that we've had to disband um, in a relatively short period of time uh, mm -hmm. because of cultural issues, operational issues. So what is happening within our police department that the controls are not in place um, and what are we going to do about that to make sure that those necessary controls get put in place um, and that we're running a police department effectively? Uh, all the while, uh, it's the bad guys don't have to play by these rules. I, I know we have to stay within parameters and whatnot, but it is a it is an ever moving target. Right, and that's why the parameters are so important. Yeah. Right, uh, because look, we're seeing a situation now where we're having to deal with um, you know possibly some of these court cases being jeopardized and that sort of thing. Uh, it is unfortunate that we, we hamper ourselves that way. It is necessary, though. We've got to get it right. Uh, we got Metro Councilman uh, Dwight Hudson in with us for a couple more minutes. Uh, and in these remaining minutes, I want to ask about the time from the Metro Council meeting till now. How have things been? Are things working smoother now, or is there an even bigger rift growing? Uh, there was a rally on Monday for the chief, and you'd be remiss if you didn't recognize, like, who was there and who wasn't, is it? What's it like on the council right now, your communication with your fellow council members? Look, I can tell you, you know, I, I met with several council members as all of that was unfolding and we went into a short recess uh, and after the meeting. I think most of those relationships are okay. There are certainly a few strained ones. Um, I'm certainly committed to working with all, everyone, you know, when and where I can. Um, but we'll continue to debate the issue. I mean, that's what we owe the citizens. Um you know, moving forward, my request, I actually met with the mayor and the chief on Friday of last week, um, aired some of those issues that, you know, I, I said about, you know, for instance, the accusations of stacking board members on the uh, civil service board and that kind of thing. I aired out my side of that, uh, asked for clarification, which they, they, when I made my argument to them, they, they said, you have a valid point there. Um, asked them to make clarifications as we went into the rally and that sort of thing. And unfortunately, they opted not to do that. And I, I find that really problematic, right? Uh, if you're going to yeah. acknowledge that, that you, you, you know, there, there is a counter argument at least uh, and that that counter argument is valid, you ought to be willing, if you're really wanting to move forward in this, you know, relationship kind of way, uh, you ought to be willing to do it. So. Right, walk, walk through that real quick because the, the, the civil service board part of this was a big part of the accusation. Sure, yeah. That opened up a lot of eyeballs or it, it should say raise a lot of eyebrows. Your end on that was what, and your take to the mayor was what? Yeah, absolutely. Look, uh, the chief has only ever come to the council with a problem on one board member. Uh, it was a lady by the name of Miss Cherry. Uh, he asked that she not be reappointed. The argument was that um, she had done some work for the union in a recent legislative session, lobbying against uh, a civil service bill that, uh, that the chief was backing. Um, look, that argument made sense to me. And ultimately, okay. we I voted, and the council as a, as a – Majority voted not to reappoint her. Um, since then, uh, we have made some other appointments. Um, but the, the fact remains that if, if the chief has a problem with someone on the board, he needs to come to us and tell us. Right. If you think if you ask him, he'll tell you he's not come to us with those issues. Um, you know, and the other issue is that if you look at the civil service statute, uh, the, the controls are in place within the statute to ensure that you can't put people on it with a political bent. Yes, the BRPD officers get to select someone. That's in the statute. The fire department gets to select someone. But otherwise, there's requirements for the people that we appoint mm -hmm. that they can't have political affiliations. And that's, that's necessary, right? So um, this argument that we would stack someone, look, you, you, would have to, you would have to be making the argument that LSU or Southern – we're who complicit. also each get an appointment themselves. They get an appointment, and then we ratify that. Is essentially right. how it works. You would have to make the argument that they are complicit in us stacking the board. Look, it's just not a reality. I, I don't hear the chief saying LSU helped stack the board, mm -hmm. right? If he's willing to make that accusation, then I, I would suggest that he needs to come on and do it. I, I don't think it's the case. The other issue is that we have a, a person on the Civil Service Board who the parish attorney's office is per currently pursuing a court case against because they are in violation of the statute. They are serving on two boards, uh, which is not allowed. Right. Uh, that person also has pending felony arrests. 
right? And and the chief hasn't said anything about that. Right. So so that's a problem for me, right? If you're going to make an accusation, get it up on national media saying that I'm stacking a board, but you're not going to say anything about someone with felony arrest that is obviously in violation of the state statute. We can't have a real conversation. We can't work collaboratively mm -hmm. if you're not willing to really have that discussion. How much collaborative work do you expect over the next month, and how much of this is about pushing pause until there's a new person in place? Can we do that, or is it we're going to have to hammer this out with Chief Paul? We as a city, I mean, a city, I'm not obviously involved. If, if legitimately everyone wants to come to the table and, and have these real discussions and actually talk about the, the details and the minutia of these things, then absolutely, I think it can happen. Uh, what I'm really worried about at this point is that everyone is dug in um, and that we're not going to see much progress. And then moving forward beyond that, uh, at this point, my real concern is making the correct appointment on the next chief, right? Right. So the council's not involved in that, um, but I can tell you we're watching it very closely mm -hmm. uh, because if there's no accountability for the way that this discussion has trans you know, has gone through now, mm -hmm. um, if there's no acknowledgement from the mayor that that the message that was and the way it was delivered at the council is totally unacceptable, um, I, I really worry about that pick for the next chief, right? Yeah. How are we going to make sure that we get somebody in there that can come in and work collaboratively with the council? Because it's absolutely necessary. Look, we approve the, the BRPD's budget. Mm -hmm. You know, we send a lot of general fund dollars to BRPD. Yeah. Um, and so it's important that those relationships exist and that we get somebody that can work with the council. He is Metro Councilman Dwight Hudson. I greatly appreciate a couple minutes this morning.